All right, everybody, here we are. Hi-Fi Summit quarter two, 2021, day one. First seminar here back again is our man from OSD, Simon Spears. How are you doing, Simon? I'm doing yeah. great, and I appreciate you guys putting this thing on again. It's You do a fantastic job, and hopefully, even when we're through the whole COVID thing, which we at least seem to be getting towards the end of, that you carry on doing these things, because I think it's a great way to meet up with people in the industry and exchange views and uh, people from around the world. Uh, it's it's right. you, know, you, you, you put on a local show, which you know some people are saying, can you put on a show? Great idea, but you sort of limit yourself to, to a geographical area and uh and and you don't get the whole world joining in which i think is is a wonderful thing that is right everybody saying Correct. hi simon hello hey, uh guys. yeah <laughs> i appreciate you letting me yeah, back on because so, because well, i you know me i just uh, i love to talk and uh yeah. sometimes I, I kind of stray off topic and uh and uh you have to kind of slap me a little bit to get me back where i should be but um uh, <laughs> well <laughs> Well, you know, I'm, I'm glad you brought a piece of audio history. You guys, si behind Simon is the world's first up-firing Atmos speaker. <laughs> it's very, very old. <laughs> you know, I've been dying to say that. Since I saw that in the background, I've been dying to say that. <laughs> so I found this thing in my parents' attic and uh, back in England, and I've carried it around the world with me because I just love it, just the look of it. It doesn't work. I've tried plugging amps into it and nothing happens. It's like a condenser speaker in there. It does supposed to connect to a, a valve amplifier, but uh, but it's actually sitting on top of a little blue stream digital streaming device. So I'm kind of bridging, I'm bridging technology. <laughs> All the new, right? Yeah. Analog and, and digital. Yeah. Right. Imagine, mm -hmm. imagine if you could actually, no, they do make products like that. A turntable that's Bluetooth, right? They do, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. Pretty sure. Uh, Kyle, Life of Bliss says, hi, Simon. Hey Kyle, how's it going? <laughs> you guys, and uh, Derek says he's ready for class. So you already know, you already know okay. when Simon's here, it's it's class time. It's well, time to learn. Okay. So, I, I talked to Simon yesterday. He's like, get ready to learn something. And so he okay. told me, yeah, I'll get started because I've got a lot of things to to, to talk about. And um, the topic of the of the of the of the seminar is is um, bit depth and and the history Ooh. of recorded sound reproduction. Um, and, Love it. I can't talk about uh, bit depth's a hot thing right now because uh, Apple's announced that they're um, you know providing high resolution audio uh, audio files now lossless, and uh, Spotify um, at least moved into the to the 1990s by getting up to CD quality um, with with their streaming services. So it's, I thought it was worth talking a little bit about bit depth, uh, and I couldn't do that without talking about the history. Of sure. the way sound has been recorded over over the years, and um, as a, as a backdrop to to talking about bit depth and why it, why I think it's super important. At, at OSD, we we make some some devices that have uh, twenty four one ninety two uh, chips in them that can decode you know super high resolution audio files under our Nero stream uh, devices and so on and SRT. So. There is a, a kind of relation to to OSD and what we do, but really this this topic is so broad it affects everybody. It should affect everybody, whether you're a Spotify guy or a Apple guy or Amazon or Tidal, whatever it is. Um, it's important to know the, the the facts behind bit depth, and I don't think you can do that without looking at the history of these things. And 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 by the way. Um, I'm, I'm going to be around between 12 and 1 for the power hour. People have questions and want to get deeper into it. And I don't know all the answers because, you know, I'm not a scientist. I'm not a physicist. Um, I tried to make this presentation accessible to most people. I'm not saying it's dumbed down, but I want it to be something that I can communicate easily. And if someone asks me about quantization of bit depth and anti-aliasing and, 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 and oversampling, you know, I'm going to say I don't even know what those things are. I, I know the names. But um, we're not going to get into it at that level. Um, but if someone has a question, I don't know the answer to. I'll find the answer. Um, for for also going to be here, a, Simon. Uh, sorry to yeah. interrupt, but uh, for for the folks who are maybe not as advanced, are you going to be talking about Bluetooth and how that might not be the best if you're using you know you're using some of this lossless streaming? You know, Bluetooth is a, is a subset and, and we can certainly talk about it okay. and I'll show where it fits in and the scheme okay. of things um, for okay. sure. Um, 
and and uh, it's it's you know Bluetooth's very per, 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 pervasive now. It's it's a, it's everywhere. And interestingly, with what Apple's doing, um, you know, they went to wireless headphones, earbuds, and things some time ago. Removed the the physical connection. And when you do that, you really you're in the Bluetooth domain, and you limit yourself to what Bluetooth can deliver in terms of bandwidth and resolution and bit depth. Um, and now they've kind of got this problem on their hands that they're that they're they're streaming uh, in high resolution files at, at 2448, but you can't get that out of the, your phone and into your earbuds. Um, it's just it's just impossible to do because um, uh, it, it's just not supported. Um, so you know they, they, they'll they'll presumably bring out some other technology to be able to stream from from the, the phones themselves to the to the headphones that they have. But that's a side that's a side thing, and happy okay. to talk about it. But it's a, all right. So uh, we're also going to be at Cedia, by the way, with a booth. So if any of you guys that are listening, oh, there you go, there you go really? Chana. Oh, I'll yeah, be we, there, man. Well, yeah, we get to yeah, take some we, pictures we, and we, stuff. Late decision, but um, we want to be there, and 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 uh, I'll be there, and happy to meet anybody who who can make it and talk about anything and everything because you know I always have an opinion on just about everything uh, <laughs> um, so there's that but let me let me just uh, say that the, the, it, this presentation I'm going to talk about history because I'm I love history of, of audio in our industry and uh, you know I fell in love with listening to music and music itself on a transistor radio in the 60s um, my parents in the in the 50s my earliest memories they had a Old gramophone with steel styluses and uh, uh, and seventy eight records on uh, uh, on shellac, um, and it, the, the audio quality wasn't great. But you know what? It didn't matter. It made me fall in love with music and and um, and, and 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 actually the act of reproducing sound because I was kind of into the mechanics of it. Um, so it's it's it, it ultimately. What I'm trying to say is that love of music is more important than anything else. It's more important than the carrier. It's more important than the, how it was re machine it was recorded on, how it was replayed. Uh, just, just, just embrace any way you can consume music is a good thing. Um, but let's let's look at uh, how you can experience absolutely the best possible way to listen to music and. Um, that comes towards the end of this presentation, but let's go back in history a little bit. And and to be honest, I could go back, um, what is it, to about 900 AD, when uh, when a couple of guys in the, in the Middle East uh, had a device that was water driven and that that drove air through pipes and produced music. So it it did reproduce music, and it kind of was a machine. Um, but not really relevant. The first one that uh, machine I looked at, let's, there we go. Um, the Panharmonicon. And see, I love the Panharmonicon uh, just because of the way it looks and its name. What a machine. And you, and you can see that it has uh, horns and pipes and drums. And, and, and this came out in about 1800. And Beethoven composed music specifically to be played on this device. And it was a, a cylinder with pins, and uh, it, 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 the truth be told, I'm kind of cheating on this one because it, it it wasn't really a, re a sound recording device. Um, it played back like an automatic music machine, and um, but I love the name of it, so I threw it in there as a yeah. two hundred year old. How, how big is something like that? Is that? Like I think that was pretty off, big. I think off. that probably was six feet tall. Something maybe. Okay, 10 yeah, feet that's tall. what it seems like. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and you can see the German eagle on top. It was built in Germany, and uh, and I just love the idea of it. And you, you you research this device, and there's not a lot about it, and yet I just anyway, the first way that that man recorded sound uh, was the French guy uh, Scott de Martinville with his phono autograph in 1857. Most people think it's Edison. It wasn't. It, this guy could record music. He just couldn't play it back. Oh. Uh, so he had no way of replaying it. So again, doesn't really fit into my seminar as the ability uh, to, to reproduce recorded sound because um, this thing couldn't couldn't play back. It could just record. But, but for historical interest, I thought I'd throw it up there. Um, the first 
way of recording sound uh, was was uh, was Edison 1877 and on a cylinder you know, wax and um, the way it worked was sound would travel through the air would would be captured by the horn it, there's a mechanical vibration attached to sound and the mechanical vibration would be translated into the wax with a little cut in head um, very basic the the engineering was was pretty basic and the sound quality was not great as you might expect but of course it was the infancy of the of the whole industry and the principle of capturing sound and sound waves and then turning them into something that can be recorded and, and, and replayed started here um, a little bit later 10 years later um, Emil Berlin actually patent, patented this in 1887 but the truth is that uh, Alexander Graham Bell um, the Bell Labs AT&T guy um, he actually showed and, and demonstrated a working example six years earlier, um, but never never patented it. But he went on to make plenty of money, so I don't suppose he was too worried. Um, and that was the the ability to insert on a cylinder to actually go on to uh, a circular disc, which is really something that uh, since then you know we've been used to all the way to today with with vinyl uh, and records. Um, uh, Early example of a tape recorder, 1909, recording on celluloid. Oh, look at that. Celluloid analog tape, huh? Yeah. What a cool device that is. Totally mechanical. Um, the, the method of recording the sound, again, a horn taking the sound, mm -hmm. diaphragm. Diaphragm moves a, a little stylus, which you can kind of see sticking out here. And it went onto the tape. And the tape was wide enough to actually have 15 tracks. Wow. <laughs> look at that. Wow. So, so wow. multi-tracking uh, in 1909. 1909, that's, dang. Yeah, yeah, that's how it was done. Um, and then around the 1920s, the big move was uh, these devices were all totally acoustic. There was no electronics involved. Captured the sound acoustically. In the, in the, in the 20s, we moved to electronic forms and uh, microphones uh, that were electronic, had a, had a diaphragm. The diaphragm could capture the movement of air when there was voice or music playing and it and that movement was then converted into tiny electrical impulses and those impulses could be um, converted into vibrations that were then recorded onto onto uh, uh, vinyl not vinyl discs back then but uh, shellac discs and um, at the same time in the 20s amplifiers uh, were were being developed they started in the in the 1910s to 20s but really it was the 20s when the early um, tube amplifiers, triode, sim very simple devices uh, were being developed and, and they could amplify the signal when, when, the, when the music that had been recorded and the microphone was being reproduced. Um, quality still pretty low, but a giant leap forward from, from the acoustic quality to the, uh, to the electronic quality. And at the 1930s, uh, that Victor device you can see is a mo lot more modern it has a more conventional tone arm um, it played at 78 inside there was a tube amplifier and a radio um, and it used a, used a, a folded horn for the speaker pretty much an early version of transmission line uh, just oh wow fascinating stuff for me I, I love this I love this stuff um, and then uh, oh, so it, it on that last one is that what you know they they those new like Victrola. Yeah, that's, that, that's what I was gonna is say. That, is that where they Victorinox got that? Toronox or whatever. I forgot yeah. what the name is. Like a Target. Oh yeah, they're... like the like cheapest turntable you can buy with a little speaker in it. Are they kind of yeah. using that name? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, Probably. yeah, 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 yeah. yeah maybe, like maybe, maybe. Um, I'll explain my the reason for going through all of this as we get down because at some point I'm going to show you what is estimated to be the bit depth, the resolution capability of all these devices that we've been talking about. Oh, cool. And, um, and, and, and then relating that to where we are today and where we've been for the last you know, 10, 15, 20 years in the digital era. Um, but I wanted this history just to, just to put a backdrop to that. Um, so the, the, the mag mag magnetophone uh, was really the first reel-to-reel uh, -reel recorder that used uh, the, the te technology that, that were then used for years and years. This was developed uh, in the Second World War by the Germans so that they could simultaneously broadcast 
propaganda messages in multiple countries. Um, you know, communication would take time. And if someone said, okay, go now, there'd always be a delay in, in those broadcasts being made over radio in different countries. By pre-recording it on these machines and sending these machines out, they could, they could literally make the same announcement at exactly the same time um, by the same person. So, And then these machines were later found at the end of the war in, 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 in different places in Europe, and a bunch of them were brought back for, for further examination to the States. And um, amazingly, Bing Crosby um, heard about these machines and their ability to record music. You gotta remember until then, radio was the way people listened uh, to, to, to music primarily, if not gramophone. And radio, nothing was recorded. It was all uh, live. So a radio listener would be listening to a live recording or not a, lot, or a live broadcast, whether it was music or, or voice, um, because the quality of, of gramophones and, and records at the time was so poor that it just didn't make sense to do that. Um, Bing Crosby had a, had a daily radio show that he had to do live. And he hated the idea of having to go to the studio and do this live thing every day. And he heard about this way of recording sound that was pretty good, got one of these machines, <laughs> recorded, recorded his daily show uh, and recorded multiple ones at the same time. And, sent yeah. them to the, and that's how Bing Crosby helped, uh, helped progress uh, the recording of good quality sound. So I've got to thank him for that. Anyway, that's the story behind that machine. Then, of course, that morphed into, into the kind of machines that you see at the BBC recording studios and then Studio Revox and Ferrograph and, and, and then the Japanese uh, companies and, and so on got into doing it. And um, master tapes uh, playing at 15 or 30 inches per second, um, half-inch tapes, um, really were the reference level recordings that could be made up until very recently uh, with digital technology with the right bit depth that can, can, can capture audio in a better way than, than the best studio tape decks. Um, so where did this lead to? We kind of had a little regression uh, in the 60s um, with obviously compact cassette uh, popularizing tape. It was an easy format to use. It was inexpensive and uh, very portable. Um, eight track uh, was around around the same time, actually higher quality, ran at a higher speed. You could get slightly better bandwidth out of it. And then there were derivatives that followed later in the in the 70s and 80s with uh, with El Cassette and, uh, and, and mini micro tape, I think. Yeah, micro called. tape. I remember that. Micro tape. Which you still see in little devices if you want to do recordings of interviews and things. Yeah, you want to record somebody on the sly. <laughs> right, right. Although there's digital things now that can do that. Yeah, probably even better, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I guess the culmination of, um, of, of analog was something like this, the Transrotor Artist Turntable. That's um, a turntable? Oh, it's at the very top. Okay. Yeah, yeah. The whole top platter floats. It's magnetic, floating. Ah. And and the thing weighs, you know, hundreds of pounds, and it's about two hundred thousand dollar turntable. Um, and so, as the technology for 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 vinyl in the late fifties, uh, you know, micro grooves, higher quality cutting heads. Um, you could actually record pretty good music on 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 a, on a record uh, in the 60s uh, moved to stereo of course in in the 70s with half speed mastering you could actually double the resolution um you could get from from uh from a record the challenge was wasn't you know recording it well because that that technology you know if you used virgin uh, everything to do it and you used the right uh, materials you can make a pretty good recording playing it back was the challenge and those of us who lived through the uh through the 70s and 80s and into the 90s we spent our lives in pursuit of trying to get as much information off the record and into our systems as possible and it was all mechanics it's all right, mechanics right it's it's getting the stylus aligned with the groove and 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 uh, getting the tone arm to exactly the right level and making sure the tracking weight was perfect and uh, anti biasing was correct 
speed consistency was a challenge. The Linson deck, you know, three point sprung suspension turntable had 17 different variables that you could adjust in order to try to get the maximum out of the, out of the record that you were playing, assuming that the record was good to start with. Um, Lynn's founder, Ivan Tiefenbrown, had this great saying, garbage in, garbage out. And if you put a bad record on, the best he could ever do with his machine was get garbage um, because you can't get more out of it than was put on it. Mm -hmm. um, so this, this turntable represents the pursuit of that goal, getting as maximum resolution as possible uh, off of the record. Um, but it could never be more than what was put on the record in the first place, and that was limited. Uh, limited by the uh, the technology uh, and the methodology and the mechanics of, of what went on. So after after analog um, came digital, and the world changed. The world changed for audio files, and to be honest, in those early days of of CD, um, it didn't change necessarily in a good way because a lot of early CDs didn't sound great. Um, and so when did, even, when did that, the, the 16 bit 44 one CD quality start? Is, is that what you mean by CDs didn't sit the first CDs didn't sound good or, um, well, the blue, the red book that was written, which was the, was the format and, and set the standards for, for CD, uh, was I think written in the early eighties. Um, and we saw CDs coming out in the eighties. And I, I think um, there were things that weren't known early on about brick wall filters and how it affected sound. And, you know, was 44.1 the sampling rate, the right sampling rate to use? Uh, were there restrictions? Was 16 bit sufficient to be ultimately to get better bit depth, uh, more resolution than you could get on vinyl? Uh, were they recorded well? Um, there was a bunch of learning curves. Pretty quickly, it was possible to get um, CDs that sounded uh, better than vinyl. Whether people agreed with that or not, technically that, that was the case with higher resolution and, and most importantly, um, more dynamic range, uh, better signal to noise ratio. Um, just because you couldn't get that dynamic range off of, a, off of no matter how hard you tried, it was a limitation of the, of the, of the system. But with CD, even at 1644, um, dynamic range was improved dramatically. And I'll show you the, 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 how they fit in on a graph uh, a little bit later and what the differences were. Uh, but of course, you had to do it well, and uh, it wasn't always possible to do it well. And, and the digital you know, revolution led to first um, to CD, to compact disc, uh, which we've just talked about. Um, I'm going to take a little sidetrack right now Ooh. Um, because I think it's important. And this is one of the, this is one of the kind of rabbit holes I went down when I was preparing this seminar. Um, I was thinking to myself, OK, so we're advancing resolution and bit depth and uh, to levels that, uh, that, that are unheard of. And now we have digital. But maybe the human ear is a filter. Can, does the human ear, you know, is it capable of resolving ultra high resolution, super high bit rates, or, or could it be a filter? So as we move into the digital era, era, excuse the pun there, era and ears, uh, does the ear get in the way? Um, most people don't know how the ear works. I didn't really, not in detail, this broad idea. So I thought I would, I would study and I came up with a few slides to talk about the human ear. Um, and you, and you can see, uh, here that, um, Sound comes in the ear, it hits the, the tympanic membrane, which is a quarter inch across. It's actually very, very similar. It's a membrane. It's very similar to the drive unit on a speaker. It's conical uh, in shape. And it receives this, it's like a microphone diaphragm as well. It receives vibrations in the air. And, and there's these, these little bones. There's three little bones here, uh, the malleus, the incus, and the snappus. Status being the smallest bone in the human body, by the way. And, and the vibrations on the back of this membrane get sort of amplified mechanically through these. So this is all still very analog, very mechanical, uh, cool, you know, and to know how this works. Um, 
and then it attaches in a much smaller surface area to the cochlea and inside the cochlea is where the, the magic happens. Um, so here's a better view of the eardrum. You can see the shape of it. That, you know, it looks like a drive unit, right? It's, 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 it's I guess, I science of imitated nature. Uh, and, and then this is the bone that connects to the back and it's held in place by these little tendons. And then there's this tiny little bone that connects to the, to the cochlea. Uh, so that's the mechanical part. It, the inner ear or the internal ear is where the real, I think this is magic. I, I just, I love this. So inside the cochlea is fluid. And you might think, well, okay, fluid's dense. It's going to slow things down. You've got these little vibrations which have been translated from air, you know, the, 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 the eardrum through the little bones to the side of this, uh, the, the, the side of the cochlea. And now you're in fluid. Doesn't that slow things down? Isn't that going to make it, uh, you know, less resolution? And the, the opposite's true. It turns out that uh, sound travels through water 800 times faster than it travels through air. I didn't know that. And, uh, and the denser the fluid, the faster it travels. And the fluid inside this little cochlear thing, which is about the size of a pea, is, uh, is kind of the consistency of blood, to give you some idea of thickness. Uh, and so way thicker than water, and sound will travel even faster through it. And the reason why that happens, if anybody's interested, God knows I, I wasn't until I started looking at this, is that uh, because water's denser, fluid's denser, the molecules are closer together. And because the molecules are closer together, when you move one, the next one moves more quickly. So it just it makes sense that the sound's going to travel more quickly, not slower through water. We think of water as resistive. When you swim through it, it's kind of hard. But when sound travels through it, it travels through it faster. Um, so now we've got sound vibrations traveling through this thing that looks a little bit like a snail. Um, and on the inside of this snail um, are these, if you look in this corner here, I don't know if you can see my cursor whir whirling around there, um, are these little groups of hairs. These are like three microns uh, high. And there's hundreds of them that run through this, this structure. And when they, re when they hear a vibration or feel a vibration in the water, they move. And as they move, they release ions at the base. And those ions can create electrical pulses. And those electrical pulses pass along the auditory nerve into the brain. And that's how we hear. Thousands of these little things waving around in fluid being affected by this vibration that comes from the eardrum through the bones, through, through the fluid. And miraculously, the front end of it, high frequencies are captured. And the deeper you go into it, the lower the frequencies are. And right at the tip of it is where the bass is, is collected. So this thing is also got, you know, it's frequency driven as well. I love this. It's, to me, it's so but going back to the question, is the, is the ear um, a, a, a filter which is going to reduce our ability to hear the sound? Uh, given that there's there's 1.5 sex trillion uh, um, molecules in the fluid that's inside that little one, you know, pea drop sized organ, um, there's nothing there that's going to slow sound down or or be a filter to it. There's plenty of room for the for the sound to move, and before that, it's all analog, so nothing's being lost. It's just being a, it's just a transition of uh, of uh, mechanical energy. So my argument, having, having looked at this in some detail, is that the ear is not a limiting factor, not in, in terms of mechanics and, and uh, the way it works. There are arguments that say human evolution has limited the necessity to have ears that can cover broader frequency ranges um, because it simply wasn't necessary in order for human beings to survive and thrive. And of course, that makes perfect sense. Um, so. In, in, you know, in human nature, when we walk outside or listen to a, a music or listen to a leaf rustling on a tree that could be 20, 30, 40 feet away on a quiet day, you can hear that, which is a miracle in itself because that sound wave that's created goes into your ear, goes through all this process and then into your brain, and then you know it's a leaf rustling. 
we can hear very, very, very low sounds and we can hear extremely high sounds as well. And um, there, there, there are uh, scientists that have, that have tried to put a bit depth on human ears and, and, and try to put it on a scale of, of where it is and, and their estimates are shown later on on, on some slides. Uh, but I wanted everybody to see how we hear and the, the apparatus that goes behind it, because uh, it's a miracle. And um, yeah, I think we have to celebrate just, just, just yeah. the wonderful nature yes. of where's, where's the whiskey? Let's celebrate now. <laughs> uh, no, the, this is actually very cool. I had no idea exactly that it was a mechanical system. Um, and, and then electromechanical at the end, and, and then yeah. biomechanical biochemical um who yeah and then there's some water and inv liquid involved like what <laughs> it's, like, it's, it's fantastic and you know we we're all audiophiles here right we're listening and 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 hopefully the everybody who's listening is, is is an audiophile and and our ears are what hear this stuff i mean they're so important in the process um and yet we spend so much time and effort looking at equipment and and amplifiers and speaker cables and power cords and Everything if you've got bad hearing, all oh, that's not going to matter, right? <laughs> well, well, you know, clean your ears once in a while. You get somebody literally up. said that in the chat. It's like, <laughs> <Okay>. yeah. <laughs> Hallelujah! That's the lesson from from Simon: is clean <laughs> your ears, clean your ears, get better audio. You want to upgrade? Buy some Q-tips. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Okay. The least expensive upgrade you'll ever make. Don't do it too often because you don't want to poke down on that delicate eardrum uh, too sure. too hard. So be yeah. careful. Uh, but definitely, definitely good to understand this and, and good to appreciate. You know, when you get a cold um, in this top picture here, this little red line that comes in, that's the Estuchian tube. That comes from your nasal cavities and your sinuses. And when you get a cold and these things fill up, the reason why you can't hear very well is because it's slowing the bones down. This little mm -hmm. mechanical interface where the bones are gets full of this nasty fluid from your cold and, and you don't hear as well. I mean, if you've ever wondered why I get a cold, my ear, my ears are blocked. That's that's what's happening. So again, important to keep those those uh, those tubes as clear as possible. And um, if you want to enjoy the best possible audio audio experience, make sure your ears are working the best they can. Mm -hmm. So back to digital. You know, so what? This is how we started the whole thing half an half an hour ago. What does 24192 or 1648 or 1644 mean? What is bit depth and, uh, and, 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 and what is sampling frequency? So sampling in those numbers, 24192, sampling is the second number. 192 stands for 192,000 times per second. Uh, the music would be sampled. Um, and then the second one, 1648, is 48,000 times a second. So you can see there's a four time improvement uh, in terms of number of samples that are taken every second, going from 48 to 192. So that's a jump. That's a pretty good jump. Um, and the first number is the, is the, the bits. Uh, and that relates to the bit depth. Now, they are different because uh, you count bits in, in the ones and twos. Um, and bit depth is, is uh, is calculated by multiplying the um, a single bit, which is which single bit is one piece of information. There are two two data points there, a zero or a one. Um, so you start with two, and then you multiply by the power of two, and you multiply that by itself, and then that by itself, and then that by, by. So in the end, uh, it's to go from sixteen bits of depth, which is sixty five. Um, 1,536 possible data points of information. The reason why this is important, because you know, music is complicated, sound is complicated. Right. If you're going to sample it, where are you going to sample it? And how many samples can you access? And with, with a 16-bit system, you can sample 65,000, or you can access 65,536 pieces of pieces of information. When you get up to 24-bit, that goes to 16 million. 777, 216 possible bits of information. That's a huge increase from 16 to 24. Uh, a lot more information available. It's a lot bigger jump than, than going from 48 uh, 
sample, 48,000 samples per second to 192,000 samples per second. So the difference between 16 bit and 24 bit is massive. Mm -hmm. um, can we hear it is the big question. Can we take advantage of that additional data points that, that are available with, with 24 bit uh, sound? I mean, I mean, uh, you know, from personal experience, um, when I'm working on a project, uh, an audio project, my mastering engineer wants a 24 bit file, which he then brings down to a 16 bit file, you know, after the mastering process. So yeah, may maybe yeah. we don't, we don't necessarily need to hear all that, but in the, in the production side, they want to, so they can take stuff out if they need to. Right. And that's the recommendation that recording engineers have been given by the AES and, and the Association of Recording Engineers. They've concluded that 24-bit is the way to, to record at least. I mean, some go higher, and then you have more room to play around with stuff. You're right. It's, it's about having room to play around without losing stuff. Um, but 24-bit is the standard now. And, uh, and, 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 and maybe not 192, 90. 96 is probably the standard, but some people are going at 192 and beyond. Um, but let's understand what happens when you get beyond 24 bit and, and, and 192 or even 96. Um, I, I threw a couple of pictures in here, different um, file formats for digital audio and, and different ways of capturing those things. Um, this is not completely inclusive, There's, there are others. And you know, in the '90s, Sony came out with mini discs to record them. Philips came out with the digital compact cassette. And Sony with their DAT um, systems. Mm -hmm. uh, all ways of trying to capture digital files onto 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 a hard format that wasn't a disc. Um, none of them were really successful. I used mini disc. I really liked it. You know, I put a lot of vinyl onto mini disc just to give me a lot of portability. Um, but it, it wasn't super successful as a format. You remember, digital recording started back in the 1970s, even before uh, CDs came out. A, a lot of albums, vinyl re records, were recorded digitally and then, and then uh, converted back to analog. Mm -hmm. um, and not many people liked them because the early days of digital, there wasn't the sampling frequencies and rates and so on. But so digital recording has been around for longer than digital playback devices. This was a this was an interesting era around the in the nineties, um, different hard formats. But the right. the, the algorithms uh, started to come out um, for for recording in digital files in different ways. Um, DVD audio, <laughs> uh, which <laughs> now big favorite of mine. I got a whole bunch of DVD audio uh, music things because guess what dvd audio can get up to 192 uh and and at 24 bits mm. it's a it's a great um medium to, to to store and replay music from but it's not you know you don't have to really you didn't have to go 192 24 you could actually go right all the way back to 24 16 if you wanted to so there was a lot of variation in in the way DVD audio uh, discs were produced. Um, if you could be sure you were getting, you know, super high resolution, then then it was great. And if you didn't, then you were back to the same level as a CD um, and everything in between, including multiple tracks as well. So this was a, a format that came out, but it was it didn't last long because um, even though it was great, uh, people were moving to digital files, uh, smaller in size, uh, more portable. Uh, streaming and um, a couple other formats, SACD Ooh, and ESD. I put these together because it's really the same thing. Same but, tech, yeah, yeah. Uh, and and they did things differently. And I, you know, I confess that it's not a, a 16-bit or a 24-bit system. It's a one-bit system that samples two million eight hundred times per second. It's a, just a different way of getting you know a, a bit depth number. And people say you can't relate the two. I think you probably can. I, I, I tried to on this slide, and, and I think uh, um, 2496 or 2192 is, has way more resolution capability than, than SACD or, or DSD, just, just by pure numbers. 
I'm happy to talk about that uh, later on. But in the end, I think DSD, 5 million possible bits of data available versus 3 million, 221 every second. Yeah, that's a big difference. Uh, so, mm -hmm. but I throw it up there just as a conversation thing. Um, so Apple announced uh, you know, spatial audio with Dolby Atmos and will bring lossless audio to their entire catalog. And this was kind of the trigger for me to do this seminar on, on this topic. Mm -hmm. um, they've, they've been talking about it in the chat. Apparently some people with the Amazon account, they were upgraded after Dol after uh, Apple did this little upgrade. Everybody was upgraded for free. Um, I know people in here in the chat were talking about it earlier. So yeah, yeah. definitely uh, definitely a timely talk here, Simon. I'm, I'm loving it. Yeah, well, it, Apple, the Apple thing, Spotify, you know, you got to love and you got to hate those guys. You love them for the way they organize music and their stations and, and the accessibility to music is fantastic. You got to hate them because they, they were broadcasting or streaming at, at such low resolution that it was just horrible to listen to for me. Uh, it was it was like very mediocre MP3 quality. They'll argue that it was a different format and it wasn't MP3 and it was blah, blah, blah and a better way of doing it. But in the end, the resolution capability just wasn't there. And now finally they think, oh, big, big, big breakthrough. We're going to go to CD quality, which is what we had in the 90s. <laughs> it's, yeah. It's, how frustrating is that? <laughs> Apple at least jumped forward, you know, several further steps and said, let's go to, 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 to 2448. Um, and most of the stuff in Apple's library is 24, uh, at, least, and at least 48, but some of it 96 and some 192. Um, so they've got all the stuff there. They've got a massive library of high resolution files. And finally, they're opening the gates and saying, now you can, you can get it through iTunes. I mean, there are some device issues how to get it out of the device and, and right and, right they said that too how do you get lossless through your you know bluetooth earbuds you can't you know yeah you can't. exactly you're, right you're totally limited to bluetooth capability which is mediocre mp3 quality mm -hmm. at best um it's kind of funny because so I, I just i i reviewed those uh apple airpods max and you know they're not cheap and this is before they announced all this so at the time i'm like oh these are pretty cool but then after this like if they knew that that was going to happen, that's kind of a weird decision it's, to go that uh, They're just anyway. making money, bro. They're just making money. Like, it's two you know, different divisions, two different departments. And I, yeah, I get probably. getting rid of wires. I, I, I love that concept. Um, but but you got to look at what the restrictions are when you do that. If your wireless broadcasting technology can't support high resolution files and other people are doing it now, then then you know that's going to be a limitation. Then you have, you create a whole bunch of little issues for yourself how to get the lightning connector and how to get the audio out of it and blah, blah, blah. But they've moved in the right direction and I applaud and celebrate that. Uh, Amazon's been doing it for 18 months now, high resolution, ultra high resolution files. Um, you know, I, I embraced Amazon music uh, back then simply for that reason. Tidal's been doing it for a long time too. Certainly not the only ones, but Amazon, with their power and their weight and their library mm -hmm. um, and their pricing structure you know, they're the giant and and I, I like what they do. Now, that world is not a simple one because just because they're streaming in, in, in you know, 24, 192 max doesn't mean you can get it. Uh, it. It all depends on your device. If your device is limited to something else, then that's all you're going to get. Um, you know, I have an Amazon Fire TV 4K stick stuck in the back of a Denon, a nice Denon AVR and that feeds through to my, my main system. And when I stream Ultra HD tracks through that, it tells me on the screen right there, you know, what the device capability is. And the Amazon Fire TV device capability is 1648. That's mm. his best. That's the best it can do. Right. So it doesn't matter what I'm what I'm streaming, it's going to be limited to that. My Denon can do better than that. Yeah. It doesn't yeah. matter. It can't get to the Denon. So um, the bottle you got right? yeah. to look for the weakest link in the chain in order to extract the maximum. Uh, I mean, in time, because imagine a, an Amazon Fire TV 4K stick. It can handle a lot of data. It's doing yeah. 4K. Yeah, yeah. 
4K HDR. Yeah, I mean. 4K video data is way, way more data intensive than 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 24192. And it can do that. It's just they haven't. So maybe the next generation of Fire TV sticks will do it. But whatever it is, whatever system you're using, you've got to look at the what its capabilities are, because that's going to limit what you can uh, what you can actually get out of it. Um, so Amazon, I mean, sorry, Apple you know, has, has made this topic really interesting. And uh, uh, if we go back in the history of digital streaming, you know, it started off with MP3 in the back end of the 90s with a few companies doing it. And, uh, and, and, and um, uh, iTunes came out in the early 2000s and kind of revolutionized it by it, making it easy to use, great access, great uh, user interfaces. Uh, but it was typically a 128 kilobit file, MP3 file, and and most people who were who were into audio could hear that it wasn't that good. You doubled it up to 256, it got better for sure. Big jump, jump to the next one, which I think was 328 or something. 356, I can't remember, uh, was better still, um, and and started to approach um, the quality of CD, but. Let's, let's look. I've got some, some charts here, and I, you know, we've got 15 minutes, and I want to get into this. I'll jump over this slide, which talks about Apple lossless and what they can and can't do, and so on. And all, all, all this presentation is going to be available on, on YouTube, so people can go back and look at it, or even ask me questions, whatever. Um, bit depth of various sources is where it kind of gets interesting to, to compare these things. Vinyl, at best, is, is 10 bit. That's people have. You know, scientists, experts have done the sums, and, and 10 bits is possible if you get a half-speed recorded, pristine, virgin vinyl, best quality turntable, uh, great cut on the disc. You can get 10 bits of, of information out of it. Cassette was down at six or seven. If you you know you've got a really nice machine, Nakamichi with with Chrome and so on, you might get seven bits of data. So still below vinyl. CD big jump, 16 when implemented properly, a lot more. A lot more information available, a lot more resolution available. Uh, different file formats, MP3, uh, the the um, iTunes, Apple lossless, WAV files, um, massive files, FLAC, smaller files. Um, takes up a lot less space than than WAV files, uh, and and it supports high resolution. So in in the FLAC in the FLAC domain, you can go to 24192 uh, and a couple of other, including DSD, which we talked a little bit about earlier. So, what does this look like? You know, and in, in, in how does it relate? Uh, going back to my phono autograph in uh, in uh, from the beginning of the presentation, the beginning of time, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm awarding that a one bit resolution. <laughs> okay, with a signal to noise ratio of six. Because here's the other thing, uh, bits and bit depth is related to signal to noise ratio and, and or dynamic range, which signal to noise ratio and dynamic range are the same thing. Um, when we jump from, from, from the phono autograph to the cylinder, uh, we, we estimate you've got two bits, which is signal to noise ratio of 12. Shellac acoustic, you know, okay, we, we're, we're, we're improving again. We're up to 18 estimates again, of course. Uh, and then when you go from the to the electronic age in the 20s, uh, we get another jump of 24 bits. 24 uh, uh, signal to noise ratio, 24 dB signal to noise ratio, um, starting to get a little bit more interesting, and um, certainly can hear a lot more of what's going on. Um, cassette, look at the jump. This is the 1920s, and really the next jump was cassette at 36, although we could talk about master tape and how good they were. I didn't put a early tape in, but I did put cassette. Signal to noise ratio of 36. I mean, a lot of people love cassette. I got a bunch of cassettes. If I only knew that they were limited to a signal to noise ratio of 36 dB, that would be a bit disappointing, right? I mean, you know, I don't know if everybody understands signal to noise ratio and, 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 and is familiar with it. Um, Good quality amplifiers, high-end amplifiers, have signal to noise ratio capability of over over 100 dB. 120 is possible, 130 perhaps possible t technically. So those those are the levels you're you're looking at, and there's a reason why that's important, and it's it's right down at the bottom of this list, second up, 
of the human ear. So the human ear is estimated to be able to hear a, a dynamic range, signal to noise ratio of 130 dB. Mm -hmm. So basically, uh, for signal to noise ratio, the higher the number, the better, right? The higher the number, the better. Uh, dynamic range, the more dynamic range you have, the better. You know, anybody who's been to a live concert or stood on the side of a street when a marching band has gone by, understands that when that big bass drum guy hits his drum right next to you man there's so much impact there's so much dynamic range because uh, there's nothing stopping it it goes straight from that vibrating drum skin through your ear into your brain and it boom once you take that that that, that drum beat and then digitize it or put it through some recording process use a microphone and start to do all the things that you do with it to get it recorded getting it back is really difficult, really difficult. Right. Because what you've got to do is you've got to get it back to here. You've got to get back to 130 in order for it to have the same impact that it did when it was live. So all these things, whether it's uh, MP3, you know, the lowest quality MP3 files have a dynamic range of 42. Vinyl was at 54. I mean, I, and I'm a big vinyl fan, but look at it. Man, it, it can't resolve and give you any more than about a 60 db of dynamic range less than half what your ear is capable of hearing mm -hmm. so it's it's a and i love vinyl don't get me wrong i really do and i still listen to it but it's down there master tape uh 78 you know 30 ips or 15 ips half inch tape you get up to 78 it's good um mp3 highest quality rate is is, is at 84 it's still lower than CD, but it's getting closer. And then comes CD with 16 bits uh, of resolution and 96 uh, dB of, of uh, signal to noise ratio, and the dynamic range. Um, and that's why good CDs really can be better than vinyl because there's a lot more dynamic range, signal to noise ratio available to you if you do it right, um, and, and you can you can get better sound. Um, Blu-ray and DVDA, you know, there's a variable range they can use, and the lowest quality uh, Blu-ray and DVD comes in at that same level at 16 bit, uh, 44 uh, sample rate. SACD, a little bit difficult to, to put SACD in there because it's a different format, the single bit, multi, you know, higher sampling rates, but it's estimated to be about 18, an 18 bit system. If if one was to do a you know a comparison, could do a comparison. It gives you 108 dB of, of, of signal to noise ratio. Uh, HDCD was better still, um, not a format that made, made any headway. The ears come in at 130, but the real important thing here is look at DVD audio, Blu-ray maximum. This is 24-bit, 192, yep. and it has a signal to noise ratio, dynamic range, better Perfect. than what your ear is estimated to be able to do at its best with no wax in the ear and... As, they should. as long as you've showered and cleaned out your ears <laughs> yeah. it'll be better yeah. than your ear yeah yeah and um so so the most important thing here is that to get better than your ears you got to get to 24 or above 22 um and this is a little graph showing where those things fit on a, on a scale but the, the next slide is the one that's really kind of impactful i think because it shows if I can make it go to the next one, there we go. Because of the nature of the way bit rate and bit depth works, these are the bits, right? One back to phonograph and all these different uh, formats, uh, one through 24, but look what happens to the data points. One bit, two data points. Damn, four, exponential eight, growth, yeah. Ex exponential, that's exactly what it is. And you're up to 16 million here compared to CD at 65,000. That's what it looks like on a graph. This is where it takes yeah. off. It takes off after SACD, after HDCD. And, and you know, there's ears right there. Sorry, I should be looking at the screen. There's ears right there, you know, which is way above all this stuff down here. And, and when you're up at this level, you've got a lot of headroom up there, better than the ears can, can, can resolve. So if you record at 24, 192 you can mess around with the signal you can you can lose a little bit and i you know i'll say i looked at the science of this and you do lose quantization you lose a little bit of stuff but um that's relevant to all digital recordings 
So look at the way this curve goes. This is crazy. This is really crazy. And, and it tells me that I want 24, even 48. Right. It's fantastic. Uh, I don't need the 96 or the 192. Great if it's there. But really the big jump is in is, is in here where you go bits to data points. The, you know, so there, there's a question from American Audio Company UK. So why do hi-fi guys love LP so much and care compare back to back-to-back -back CDs and claim LP sound better? It's a really good question. I mean, I, I guess there's some psychoacoustics involved. Um, uh, maybe all the stuff that's recorded onto the CD isn't good. Uh, maybe there's some digital artifacts that are there that, that don't sound great. Maybe maybe 1644, you know, when you're sampling at 44 kilohertz, um, human ear, hearing goes to 20, but there's harmonics. And the, the Nyquist argument is, is that, you, you know, you, 44 is the number you need to be at. And they put a brick wall filter in and can you, that brick wall filter has resonances. There's a number of things in the CD with 1644 that, um, that, that, could be the reason why it doesn't sound as good as vinyl. Mm. Um, I wonder but, if it has to do with the recording as well, because sometimes the recording on both are, are different. You know, the way they're mastered, sometimes you have two different kind of, you know, recordings. So, yeah, just wondering maybe, how much six, of that. maybe 60 dB of, of headroom and dynamic range done perfectly is, is better than 90. Done, done poorly. Right. Right. Mm. Right. It, it, but 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 in a real world with science and 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 doing things right, uh, when you get way up there in in terms of sampling rates and uh, and um, and 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 bits uh, of information that's available, if the people who say that your ears are set at one thirty as a as dB of signal to noise ratio dynamic range, if they're right, and I and I and I think the ears are probably better than that. I mean, just looking at what goes on in your ear is just phenomenal. I think it's you know you probably go to infinity, but but you know the experts say it's one thirty. Um, you got to get beyond that, right? Right, it, right. Because if you're not, everything below that is going to have some compromise in some way that may be audible, and maybe the early or some of the CD recordings just weren't done well. Um, so streaming, I looked at streaming, and these are the streaming systems available. The digital radio, lowest quality, probably a 32-bit system. Uh, cassette shouldn't be in there, should have taken it out. But MP3, uh, data points, um, 128. It's not many. <laughs> Original Apple, Spotify, Amazon, the lowest quality is an 8-bit system with just 256 data points. That's not very many. You know, You can see why the lowest quality streaming solutions don't sound good. You know, vinyl's better, up to a thousand. Master tape, eight thousand. You can see the way this exponentially grows. Spotify, MP3, uh, digital radio at the highest quality, same same CD quality, sixty-five thousand. Uh, DSD, you can stream and you can access files, uh, DSD files, and they will come in at about two hundred sixty-two thousand uh, data points. Here's your ears at 4 million data points, and here's Amazon Tidal and, and the other you know, ultra-high-res streaming services, 16 million. And, and this is what it looks like on a graph. You've got that exponential curve again. And anybody down here streaming music down here on any of these things? Sorry, I've got some master tape. Shouldn't be in there. Um, anybody streaming down here isn't getting it. Just mm -hmm. isn't. I mean, it's just not as good as the ear can perceive. So you're... you're, you're um, not deluding yourself you're, you're just restricting yourself from something that could be better and for a lot of people it doesn't matter me with a transistor radio in my bedroom listening to radio carolina at, at four o'clock in the morning passionate about music loving what i was hearing i didn't care that it was like 64 data points i didn't care it's music <laughs> i love right. it um and and that's fine that's absolutely great uh for for, for you know for anybody who and, and I still like doing it that way. I don't care where the music comes from, but I'm in this industry and, and I understand what's going on and I want it the best it can possibly be. And I'm not happy until I can, I can approximate that. So I'll, I embrace it. I mean, I hate, I hate, hate, hate. And I'm sorry, I shouldn't hate because we don't live in a society that should hate. Um, but I read blogs and, and forums and things, people who are Spotify or Apple guys. And before they went to high res, 
oh, I can't hear the difference. There is no difference between. <laughs> and now all of a sudden they hear a difference. And now all of a no. sudden, oh, Apple <laughs> says it's okay to hear it. Now I can hear it. <laughs> and I'm being a little bit cynical and I apologize for that. But but my point is that it, it's, I, I don't like that disingenuousness. Right. Right. Um, this is kind of fact, if you like. And, and a lot of people will come back and say, well, you're not looking at it correctly and digital doesn't do right. that. And quantization effects and all, all that stuff and you're right you're right but by and large you know this is this is close to being the truth um about these things and it's 11 o'clock we should be done and thank you everybody who's been sat on this thing i know there's not a, a seminar directly after this one so i'm not interfering with someone else's time slot so let me um, ask you this uh simon where where would um like Sirius or XM radio, like land on that? I, you know, I'll look that up. I don't know. I, I suspect it's, um, would it be like digital radio highest or would it be lower than that? I, I think it's probably close to digital radio highest. I think it's in that spectrum. And, and I think, um, Pandora would be in that range too. I don't know. I'm making that up because I didn't look at it and I should have. Right, done. right, right. No, I only asked because Joe was making fun of me the other day about, about listening to serious radio in my car. <laughs> I do. It's great. There's some great stations and it's music and, and it's clearer than the radio. Oh, he's still, he was saying because I have this big like uh, 23 speaker banging all ups and system in my car. And he's like, you're just listening to this crappy quality. <laughs> coming through on Sirius so yeah, you know I haven't had it in a while so I don't know what it if it got better but I remember before the bit rate was pretty it was pretty bad pretty bad yeah probably like 128 or something like that yeah and we spend a lot of time when we used to spend a lot of time in cars and in, in the 80s I had a Sony Pro Walkman cassette with the best quality tapes and that was my source in my car system with Alpine amps and speakers everywhere and and I loved it but so yeah um yeah, i don't know those formats and i should have i should have researched them and and put them on this chart because it would be interesting to see exactly where they fit in maybe i'll update this and uh we, we can update the, the the charts or something but um you know what at the end of the day and to to kind of wrap up the, the mm -hmm. little slide presentation here what's the best way to listen to music well, live <laughs> that's it All right that's All right. it there's nothing in between the music in your ears it's not being recorded and re-recorded and messed around with and sampled and cut into vinyl or acetate or anything it's just direct to your ear yeah and uh and i listen to music live every week if i can and no matter what the venue tiny little you know bar at the end of the street that has a musician playing i'll go um and i'll get tickets yeah. when i can although i think Ticketmaster is the, the, the they're the new scalpers uh no StubHub, StubHub. StubHub. They'll, 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 you'll get your tickets for. They'll get the tickets from Ticketmaster and then put it up. The twenty-five dollar tickets turned into a thousand dollar ticket on StubHub. And trust me, I know I've had to buy them. It's okay, ridiculous, ridiculous. It is, the whole thing's ridiculous. I, I yeah, I, yeah. I did get tickets for Van Morrison in San Diego for less than a hundred bucks. It's, wait, I, right recently? Well. Yeah. What? He's still alive? No way. <laughs> no way. Dude, I play Van Morrison at every wedding, like at least three songs, at least three songs. Right, um, right. And yeah. and you know, um, same same thing with um, you know, with with live events. There's also um, because I used to when I was living in L.A., I used to go to the Hollywood Bowl like I don't know, like 15 times a year because I was one of the like, uh, you know, at KCRW. I was part of their group, and there was concerts over there for electronic music, and then I was also part of like the little patrons thing um so i get they're like hey we're doing a vivaldi we're doing this we have all kinds of cool stuff and i got some super seats for you and that is what right in front of where they mix the sound so all the sound is mixed to that point so if you're ever going to the hollywood bowl don't get the boxes up front unless you really want to and like i i saw beck up there i saw uh roger waters do uh the wall um up there i still have the ticket it's upstairs uh box three <laughs> seat five awesome uh, right up front but the better sound is is at these super seats so if you're ever going to the hollywood bowl get yourself some super seats and um and, and check it out because that's where they tune all the sound to all right yeah. well i'm seeing dead and co at the bowl i guess it's november no december 
So I don't know where our seats are. We we went way back because they were so expensive. But. Oh yeah, yeah. I, I've been in the nosebleed seats as well. And then there was this one time when a buddy of mine from college actually used to run all the um um all the food there, right? For um for whatever company it was. That's actually how I got to so close for the Roger Waters one. Cool. That that was free. <laughs> and it was it was amazing. I just had to buy him some beers. Quick <laughs> quick question about uh some of your Nero like streaming devices, Simon. Uh, what do what can those stream at? I mean, uh, I, I thought I saw some that are uh, that they go over Wi-Fi, stuff like that. Yeah, like versus Bluetooth, right? The, the 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 chipset we use is capable of uh, twenty-four one ninety-two, um, but all the other limitations apply. You know, how does it how does it get to the device? What service are you using? What are the limitations of the service? Uh, if you're streaming uh, Amazon Music, which we support at least right now on the on the uh, iOS app, um, you can have Amazon HD uh, as a streaming service, and it's it streamed to the box, and so you can get the higher resolution quality. But um, you really have to understand the chain of how the signal gets to where it's going, and and then whether or not there's a limitation or a filter somewhere else in the system that's going to Going to, going to make it worse and it's not easy i guess my question is in the a lot of people want something wireless like that's that's kind of for a lot of people they want to be able to stream something wirelessly yeah. is with with some of this the wireless tech is it possible to for that to not be the bottleneck the wireless part uh yeah it is possible because there's a lot of bandwidth on wireless now it's mm. not it's not like it used to be um and if the bandwidth is there to stream, which it is to stream, you know, 24192, it's that's not ultra high bandwidth ultimately compared to video, which you can stream. Wirelessly. That's true, right? Uh, it, it's still just audio, so you can definitely stream it and you can get it into the box. It's, it's the question of then what happens after that. Um, and are you streaming using your phone as the uh, as the as the portal for the music? So is it coming to your phone first and then being rebroadcast over Wi-Fi to the device? And if that's happening, what's your phone capable of? You know, my LG V30 can do 24192. I can get files in and out uh, without sacrificing resolution. Uh, but most phones can't do that. So your phone's the gateway and your phone's the limitation. Right. Um, so you've got to look at the, 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 the holistically of the whole thing. And ultimately, you know, when you're at home, Look at all the equipment you've got, how you're accessing your streaming services, find the weakest link and improve and update it right. so that it ceases to be the weakest link. I think a I'm lot almost... of times these wireless things, though, they your phone is almost just the controller. So they're downloading directly, you know, to the device and then you're controlling from your phone, but there's you know, your phone is actually out of the picture in some cases. So well, and I think there's some confusion confusion about that, about where the actual um, stream is going to. Is it going directly to the device, or is it coming through your phone as a portal first? Mm. Um, and and that's a subject we can talk about, um, right? And research sure. into it might be useful for for the listeners to. I mean, that. you're almost you're almost convincing me to just carry around a two thousand dollar streamer everywhere i go <laughs> and some, some nice headphones <laughs> totally taking the portability and convenience factor out of the equation <laughs> well you know you can get pretty good little uh micro little DAC, yeah yeah oh. and 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 get, get them in if you've got you know my lg i've got i don't know several thousand high resolution songs on there uh, and i can listen to it on a plane i'm going to be streaming or anything it's all it's all in my phone you got yeah. a decent phone, but there's Anderson Kern and all these other guys that do these cool little um, um, di digital uh, playback devices. Invest in them and, and get the files, and you'll be surprised at the difference in quality. Yeah, no, great totally. pair of headphones, in ear monitors, really good quality uh, playback device, high quality files 24196 or 2448. Um, astonishing. And I challenge anybody not to hear the difference. It's, it's, it's totally possible. I did Very see a cool. comment someone made. Adam uh, was talking about live performances being limited by the uh, the amplifiers, DSP. Um, 
I, I think, yeah, and there are limitations, of course. I mean, speakers them on stage are, are going to be a limitation. But you're not going through a recording process. You're not recording it somewhere yeah. and, then, and then reproducing it somewhere else. There, there's like less steps is what you're saying. There's less right? steps. There's less steps. Yeah. But, it, but it is true. An acoustic performance, you know, someone playing a piano or a guitar right in front of you, um, there's nothing in between at that point. And that's, that'll tell you all you need to know about signal to noise ratio, dynamic range, how good your ears can perceive things, you know, from the tiniest brush of a finger on a string. Uh, to, a, to a drum being hammered by a marching band guy walking by. Um, it's, it's the ear is phenomenally good. Don't kind of, um, uh, what's the right word? Don't, don't accept the quality that's less than it because you're doing your own ears a disservice. Mm. <laughs> right. Like don't, don't try not to go below that 130. Yeah. Yeah. All right, I've uh, overstayed my welcome, yeah. I'm sure. So 12 never, to 1. Never. Uh, you can check out during the Sound Power Hour. Simon, you said you're going to be in here. Yeah, uh, I'll be there. Let's see here. Uh, yeah, this is the page for OSD. They have, you guys have all kinds of stuff. You got your wireless streamer, outdoor speakers, and those amplifiers that everybody wants. Mm -hmm. Your multi-channel yeah. amplifiers. And um, giveaway. So, yeah. You got, yeah what do you guys have here? 2.1. Uh, oh, okay. So these uh, Mod Q2s, uh, my review is going to be out on those pretty soon. I like those. And this SS8 Slim DSP subwoofer, that small, that's like going to be a good little system right there. Paired with the yeah. Nero XD Stream app. Yeah. And that uh, that Nero Stream XD does, does 24192. There you mm -hmm. go. I like how you do the whole seminar and you barely like, you know, you don't try. I mean, to that's, that's, so that's, that's so that, cool. that, this is exactly what we want from all the seminars. Like, and that was the, like in the first one, you know, we have all these other companies that are just like, okay, so our new thing is like, I'm like, oh, okay. I thought this was supposed to be an educational talk and I gotta, I gotta give it up to you, Simon. Um, that was awesome. I, I learned you. a whole lot. So yeah, um, well, we appreciate you know, it. That learning is should be a never-ending process, and it was for me putting this Agreed. together. I really enjoyed doing it. I learned a lot too, and being able to share it's great. Um, hopefully, uh, it'll lead to more enjoyment of music, and uh, there's no better goal than that. Sounds well good. said. Well said. Well, Chana, you want to wrap it up, and Simon, if you want to pop into the VIP video chat, we can hang out there for a little while. Um, I probably need to get a little bite to eat or something, but. Yeah, I'll, I'll do yeah. the same. I'll join you there shortly. Do I need an invite for that or just? No, no. So, you know, just... let's just let's just hang out for a little bit and I'll see you at 12, actually. Okay. We'll take cool. a little break. All right. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate the time. Thank you very much, Simon. And uh, for all of you watching here, this is uh, day one of the Hi-Fi Summit, quarter two, 2021. Uh, Simon, of course, is with OSD, uh, which, you know, they're, they got a lot of names. Optimal speaker design, outdoor speaker depot. You can make um, up your own, whatever you want uh, to call it. Original Saturday dance party. Oh wait, no, that was, <laughs> that's that's not right. That's not right. Anyway, um, we are all headed into the. Um, well, I, I, um, um, Simon will be at the power hour at noon. Uh, if you guys go to the main page at the top, it says VIP area and click to enter the VIP video chat room. I'll be there in a few minutes. Uh, I'm going to grab a snack and yeah, you guys go over there, hang out, talk. And um, we have the next uh, seminar is going to be at uh, 2 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. It's uh, Valencia Theater seating. So we have a nice little break. Um, so you guys can go hang out in the video chat and then also um, ask Simon some questions at the power hour. And yeah, journey to the top continues. Hi-Fi Summit, day one, quarter two, 2021. See you Thanks, soon. Simon.